Um, I'm Mo Srivastava. Um, I spent most of my life as a consultant. Um, <laughs> until last year, until almost exactly a year ago, um, no one had signed my paycheck since I was 25 years old. I was a um, <laughs> consultant for, I, I still consult a bit. But last year I signed up with TriStar Gold uh, to help them advance a, a gold project in uh, Brazil. And um, that's the, uh, the, the project that uh, kind of gives the, uh, the focus for this discussion. The, the discussion will mostly be on kind of methodology and ideas, and, and we'll use that Brazilian gold project as the, uh, the template for it. Uh, so thanks to Nathan, thanks to the rest of the McEwen mining uh, team here for uh, sponsoring and organizing and sustaining this series of talks. They, they've got a, a great series of them. If you haven't seen them yet on the uh, on YouTube, you can find them all. It's a it's a good series and, and well worth the the effort they've put into it. Um, where are we here? There we go. So, so so here's what I'll do in um, the next 30 minutes or until Nathan gives me the hook. Um, I, I would like to talk a little bit at the beginning about something that um, you you may not have got when you had your one statistics class that you ever had and that you hated. Um, it, it's a the the Bayesian way of looking at uh, uh, statistics and inference. I'd like to talk a little bit about that because it informs um, the way that I, I like to think about our task as people who model the Earth and try and figure out um, what to do with a project, how to advance a project, whether to move on from a project, whether to drop it and try and find something else. Um, uh, and so somewhere towards the end of that first segment, you'll think, boy, is he off in the weeds. <laughs> like, I'm not sure why we're doing this in a mining lunch and learn talk. <laughs> but but, but I'll, I'll try to get back out of the weeds pretty quickly and, and, and talk about Castelo de Sonhos, a project in Brazil, and, and explain where it was when we got involved um, pretty much exactly a year ago. Um, I'd like to talk about the mining industry's struggle with uncertainty. We, we live in an industry, we work in an industry um, where uncertainty is um, an essential piece of what we have to deal with. Um, all the way from what's in the ground to what's gold price going to be six months from now. There's a lot that we don't know, and we have to navigate through that. Um, and I, I, my assessment is we don't do that very well. Um, the mining industry um, likes expressing things in a, using phrasing that sounds certain. And, and, and they're reluctant to acknowledge the uncertainty that's present in the problem or the analysis they're doing, the, the decision, the business decision they're trying to make. And I think that actually complicates making good business decisions when you don't have um, a coherent understanding of the, uh, the uncertainty that's involved. Um, but but there, there is a way to, um, to, to bring that back into the analysis. And I'll talk about how we did that for Castello de Sonhos. Um, and then probably about half the talk will be sitting in here looking at what we did on that gold project in Brazil. Um, and at the end, maybe we'll have a few minutes for a bit of discussion and conclusions. So, so this is um, the Reverend Thomas Bayes, um, who was a, a minister, a man of the cloth in the 1700s. <laughs> Actually, it's not Thomas Bayes. But what this is is the photograph that, or, the, or the drawing that someone chose to use in a 1936 biography of Bayes. And it's become the de facto picture of Bayes, although it certainly almost is not him. It's just some guy that looks like it might have been him. Um, but. Why does it matter? It's Bayes now. Um, so, so he was a, a minister. He was an English guy. He was fortunate enough to have been educated at the, in Scotland at the University of Edinburgh. Um, and his fascination in life was with probability. And, and back in the 1700s, it usually revolved around games of chance. And, and it was difficult for him as a man of the cloth to um, uh, be open, to be out of the closet about his fascination with chance. You know, God is supposed to determine everything, and if you start trying to build a framework around how chance and probability work, you're running a little bit counter to your, your day job. So, so Bayes' work on mathematics and probability was not published until he died. It was all published posthumously. Um, uh, but uh, the, the huge gift that he gave to the 
mathematical uh, world with something called Bayes' theorem. But what Bayes' theorem is, is um, uh, it, it's an interesting uh, inverse way of thinking about statistics. And, and, and at the beginning I said this usually isn't taught in Statistics 101. Um, the way that statistics is commonly applied, you begin with a hypothesis. And you may remember that phrasing, the null hypothesis. You start with a hypothesis, and then you take the available data that you've got, and you check to see how consistent they are with that hypothesis. So you're trying to work out the probability that you'll see the data that you're looking at, given that your hypothesis is true. Um, and you generate some kind of a statistic, a t-test or an f-test, and that tells you something about the consistency between your data and your hypothesis. What Bayes did was formulated what's often called an inverse probability rule. And what Bayes does is he tells you how your belief should change. Um, your belief in a given proposition, what's often called the prior in, in the jargon of mathematics, um, how your belief in a given proposition changes as new data become available. And, and, and so what he's trying to work out is the probability that a certain uh, supposition is true given observed data. So, so that's why we often call it an inverse kind of way of thinking about it. Um, a, a lot of people think that Bayes' way of thinking about it is actually the way that things work in the real world. We actually all have prior beliefs about things. We have beliefs about whether our daughter's boyfriend is, shouldn't be her boyfriend. Um, we have beliefs about what gold price will be next year. We have beliefs about whether it'll rain tomorrow. <laughs> Those are all just things that we do as we travel through the world. Um, and then things happen. We observe certain events in the world, and that causes us to rethink our prior assumptions. Um, so we might actually meet our daughter's boyfriend. He might actually be way better dressed than we thought. We might think, oh, OK. <laughs> so maybe I was wrong about that. Um, and so uh, Bayes' formulation allows us to take um, something that existed beforehand that we had a certain belief about and to um, update it using evidence or data. Here's a, an example. The, the prior in this case is that I'm near the ocean. All of you right now, if I just asked you, are you near the ocean, you, you have a belief about that just based on whatever you know. Um, and the piece of evidence that enters into this is that you picked up a seashell. And so what how does your belief in being near the ocean change if you happen to pick up a seashell off the ground? And so, so this is Bayes' rule. It tells you how to do that calculation. And the, the conclusion in that little cartoon is that, statistically speaking, if you pick up a seashell and don't hold it to your ear, you can probably still hear the ocean <laughs> because the existence of the seashell puts you close to the ocean. Um, so, so here's where we're off in the weeds a bit. And, and I want to bring it back to what we're talking about today. And, and I'll start by pointing out that this wasn't the first time that I almost came to um, uh, McEwen. Um, it, it actually was about almost, it'll be coming up six years ago, um, that Rob McEwen had someone contact me to see if we could get together and talk about something. We never actually did get together traded a few emails, and then both got busy and never quite worked it out. And the reason that he called me is that Rob McEwen has a guilty reading pleasure. Um, here's the National Enquirer from February 2011. We've got the uh, dying Liz Taylor. We've got OJ Simpson in jail. We've got Brad and Angelina always breaking up. Um, John Edwards, you might remember John Edwards. He was going to jail. And then down here in the corner, We've got me looking like some exotic Balinese fan dancer, <laughs> um, the guy who cracked the lottery code. Um, he won 19 times out of 20. <laughs> and what that was all about actually predates the, the Wired Magazine article and the National Enquirer article um, by about eight years. Back in 2003, the, the first time I ever was given an instant scratch ticket it was this one. Um, I looked at it and I thought, wait a second, I, I can figure out if this is a winner or a loser without scratching anything off. Oh, yeah. and, and so um, 
<laughs> the way you're supposed to play the game. It's supposed to scratch off all these numbers on the side. And it's like a little tic-tac-toe thing going on. And over here, you got this alignment of uh, numbers that you scratched off. And that makes the card a $3 winner. Um, and, and the way that I was able to do that was using Bayes' theorem. Um, because you can go to the web and check the Ontario Lottery Corporation. They will tell you what the prior is. That they'll actually tell you how many cards are $3 winners, how many cards are $5 winners, $10 winners. So when you just get a random card at the 7-Eleven or the Petro-Canada, you already know what the chance of that being a winner is. And, and you know the, the value. Um, you know the probability according to value. Um, and the specific data that you have here, the new information that you have, is the specific numbers that are on the face of the card that are visible at the beginning. And, and you can leverage that using Bayes' rule to update your probability. So typically, a card, about one third of the cards in the game were winners. Um, I was able to get the probability up to 95%. So, so I could actually separate winners from losers almost perfectly, not quite perfectly. Um, the Lottery Corporation hated that. Um, and and it, it, it particularly offended them that a geologist did that. <laughs> um, I, I was in a meeting at the Lottery Corporation headquarters where they had some of their vice presidents there, um, one of them from their printing company. And at one point in frustration, he says, out loud, he says, why are we listening to a geologist? <laughs> And, and everyone else had already introduced themselves, <laughs> PhD statisticians and everything. And so I said, not only are you listening to a geologist, you're listening to someone who doesn't have a PhD. <laughs> so I, and I broke your game. Um, <laughs> so I, I won't get into the details of that. <laughs> there, there's a um, uh, pretty good write-up in Wired Magazine. And that's probably the one that Nathan uh, identified at the beginning there. Um, but, but the reason I wanted to um, point to this is the reason this was obvious to me was because of my work in geology and resource estimation. But when I saw the grid of numbers, to me that was like a, a grid of drilling data or a resource block model. It was like a little map. And I thought, well, I know how to analyze that. I know what kind of uh, calculations I can do in that. And I knew how to apply a Bayes-style updating rule to um, improve my chances of winning. So, so the reason it was obvious was actually because of my work in geostatistics and, and geology. Um, so the, the Castello de Sanos project was, was one of the uh, first opportunities I, I, I had to really push the idea with uh, a, a cooperative, uh, receptive audience that our task should be to try and say something about the the range of possibilities. And I'll give you the background to the project when we got involved. Um, it's in uh, south of the Amazon in Pará State in Brazil. Uh, in the 1980s, there was a lot of alluvial mining on the flanks of the plateau. In the 1990s, Barrick realized that there must be a source um, of gold on the plateau. Um, and so they conducted a small drilling and uh, soil sampling program. They left the project in 96 because they had bigger fish to fry in South America. Um, in, 2000, in the 2000s, the Peros, the local artisanal miners, moved onto the plateau from the, the, the surrounding plains and worked off of the barrack trenches. So, so they, they knew the barrack trench results. They just opened up these big uh, super trenches and pits, kilometers of them, on top of the plateau. Um, in uh, around 2011, 2012, TriStar Gold uh, gets the property drills about 143 holes, uh, soil sampling and geophysics, and met test work. Um, in 2014, they published a 43101 report with the resource estimate in it. There was some really good um, uh, news in that uh, 43101 report. It, it's clear when you look at the soil anomaly, which is the colored thing here, um, and the outcrop of the conglomerate that the two are almost coincident. So, so you, you have a really strong sense that that's a mineralized conglomerate. That's what's creating the soil anomaly. And it even steps over exactly where structure offsets the conglomerate. Um, and it was also apparent by 2014 that every drill hole that intersected at least half of the conglomerate band hit gold of economic thicknesses 
and economic grades. That there's no barren hole in the conglomerate. Um, the only barren holes are either off the conglomerate or they're dinky little short holes that don't really penetrate much of a 250 meter band. And they had good metallurgy, uh, high gravity recoveries. The, the bad news from that study was that it reported 300,000 ounces of gold in the indicated and inferred categories. And at 300,000 ounces, that project is just too small for most, most mining companies. You'll, if you try and mine it at a, a major industrial scale, you'll be through it in a, a few years. And it doesn't have the, the, uh, the gold content to support a, a, a sizable operation for a decade. But if you take a look at where the resource is, it's the blue footprint here, it's very spatially restricted. Um, and it essentially just follows the drill holes that are available. So with the, the money that TriStar had available to it uh, four or five years ago, they, they did the most drilling that they could. Um, but it was tough times for the mining industry. It still continues to be a bit tough. And, and they couldn't drill everything. And, and so they had to make the best of what they could do. And they were able to define a resource right around there. But what, by the time that we got involved uh, a year ago, um, the the anchor that we had, the thing that made it hard to advance the project, was that everyone we talked to who knew the project kind of thought of it, oh, is that, that little project on some plateau in Brazil, it's got like a couple hundred thousand ounces of gold, right? And, and, and then you had to kind of try and reset their, their understanding and their expectations. Um, but part of the difficulty that we faced was that a resource had been stated. And, and you can't just wipe that off the table and say, ah, oh, forget about that. We want to start all over again. Um, over the past quarter century, the um, international mining industry has, has converged on an increasingly harmonized set of regulations for resource reporting. Um, and the reporting codes, for the most part, require that mineral resources be presented as one clear tonnage and grade. Um, it's actually in 43101. You, you're allowed to show sensitivity studies in a 43101 report, but you have to highlight or bold, or you have to make absolutely clear to the reader which you're hanging your hat on. You, you can't say, I think the resource is between X and Y. That's not permitted. Um, and, and that's very different from the regulatory environment of the petroleum industry, where um, they commonly report what they call a P10 and a P90. So in, in oil and gas projects, when they're reporting resources and reserves, um, they often say, well, it's somewhere between here and here. And, and that's absolutely fine. It allows them to move forward with their decisions. So the, um, the thing that I wanted to bring into um, TriStar was that kind of P10, P90 thinking. I wanted to be able to talk about the low side and the high side. Um, and the reason that was important for us is we needed to create in the minds of potential investors a reason for investing in the project. If this is a 300,000 ounce project, it's not worth investing in. If it's bigger, then people can think about the, the upside possibilities. And so we, we need a way to be quantitative about that, but we still need to conform to um, the regulatory environment. Fortunately, 43101 does embrace the notion of an exploration target range. Um, for, for a document that is very heavy on definitions, um, it's strange that they never define the term, not even by reference to the CIM definitions. It shows up, and we kind of know what we're talking about, but it's never actually spelled out. Fortunately, the JORT code in Australia has a, an explicit definition that kind of embraces our, our sense about what we're talking about here. We're talking about something um, that um, is expressed in terms of tons and grade. Um, but it relates to a project for which there's been insufficient exploration to estimate a mineral resource. And, and the key words there in the JORT code, and, and this does also show up in 43101, is that you, you now must report it as a range. You, you cannot report an exploration target as x tons at a grade of y. If you try, the regulators will slap you down and say that's cheating. And, and, and so this is the place that the geostatistical approach really fits in nicely because you have an obligation to report a range. Um, there's a bunch of disclaimers that you need to throw in when you're reporting an exploration target. Um, 
you have to make it abundantly clear this is not a resource estimate, that more exploration needs to be done, and when further exploration is done, you might not get a resource that's in the exploration target range. So you have to emphasize the conceptual nature of it. But it's still helpful because it helps investors understand the project and it allows correct scaling of the project. But when we got involved in, in this project a year ago, they had envisaged this as something kind of like a glorified Garin Perro operation with portable Nelson concentrators in wheelbarrows kind of running around the plateau, selectively concentrating uh, gold. Um, and the scale was just absurd. Like it was a few hundred tons a day and it wasn't, wasn't going anywhere. Um, and, and so what we were able to do with the exploration target range that I'll show you in a second, is we were able to kind of talk about the project on a scale that allows sensible engineering and economic analysis to be done. So here's the um, quick look at the um, quantitative risk assessment. The, the first thing we have to do, well, let me back up a second. What we're going to do here is we're going to build a whole bunch of computer models. We're going to do what geostatisticians call a conditional simulation. So, so that'll give us a hundred different versions of what the gold deposit might look like. And when we build those versions, we'll need to sort out things like directions of continuity and trends. Does the gold grade tend to increase or decrease in a particular direction? And, and in order to do that, in order to pick all of our statistical parameters in a way that makes sense geologically, we need to understand the geological environment we're dealing with here. And there were two competing views when, when we got involved a year ago. One view said this is a syngenetic mineralization. It's essentially an ancient placer deposit. Um, so gold grains arrive uh, in the bottom sediments of streams and creeks and riverbeds. Um, through flowing water, and then they get trapped in the bottom sediments. The, the second view is this is epigenetic, and that the gold arrives there in hydrothermal fluids, kind of traveling through cracks and fissures and porous rock. And, and those two models give you very different understandings about directions of continuity. In, in the first one, your direction of continuity will be sub-horizontal in the original depositional system. In the uh, second view, it'll be subvertical, parallel to faults and fractures. And, and you have to make up your mind. Um, you have to figure out which horse you're going to ride here. So what, what we did is we did a lot of statistical analysis. Um, and our view was that the weight of evidence favors the view that the project is a paleoplacer. Um, so for those of you who think about things like um, Dawson's Creek, the Klondike Gold Rush, old grizzled miners sitting on the edges of creeks and rivers sluicing gold out of, out of uh, the gravels. That's what Castello de Sonios was about two billion years ago. Um, and that guy's not quite two billion years old. But, but if he had been there, he would be able to just get the, the gold out of the loose rock. And, and so there's a lot about the, uh, the data that support that view, the good metallurgical response, the fact that virtually all the gold is in the conglomerate band, and, and the fact that gold does not correlate with proximity to faults and fractures. Um, if, you, if you look at um, the distribution of gold, these little box plots that show us how the, the gold grades are changing in different lithologies. Uh, on this side, we've got the coarse pebble conglomerates where all the pebbles are touching each other. And, and we move in the finer direction here. So the, we get smaller and smaller pebbles, and they get further and further apart until you get to the point where you've essentially got a sandstone <laughs> with occasional pebbles in it, and then finally you've just got sandstone. And that's as you move from the, the proximal direction near the source that you're eroding to the distal direction, the sediments will just get finer on you. And, and the, the gold grades seem to follow that, that trend. Um, analogs for Castello de Sonios, um, the, the best ones are Tarqua, and Jacobina, they're best because of their age. They're exactly the same age as Castello de Sonios. Um, Vitz, of course, is the, the kind of giant elephant in placers. Um, and, uh, but, but it's about 600 million years older. Um, there's actually a good current day analog off of Nome, Alaska. The, they, they, they dredge the bottom sediments off the sea floor and recover a lot of gold out of them because there are 
um, a few rivers that are feeding gold into the marine environment off of Nome. Um, one thing that we knew from the early analysis was that although Castello de Sanos was geographically closer to Jacobina, it was more similar mineralogically to Tarqua. Now we didn't, we didn't understand that at the beginning. Um, I, I want to just spend a, a couple of minutes and show you the piece of analysis that um, really helped convince me that this was um, primarily a placer environment. It uses a, a data mining technique called recursive partitioning. Um, so when you've got great gobs of data and you're trying to figure out the patterns in it, um, recursive partitioning is a, a brute force computer technique in which you just throw all the uh, data into the hopper, you, you identify the variable that you're interested in, gold in this case, and the computer just races through every possibility of yes, no questions that split the data set into a high grade and a low grade population. So it just takes all of your geological logging information, color and alteration and depth and whatever. It, it doesn't know anything about geology. It's just being a, a number crunching monkey and just trying to see what separates the two. Um, and then it's called recursive because once you do that split, as you'll see in the next slide, then you can split again and split again. So what you get out of recursive partitioning is a tree of questions that separate higher grade from lower grade. If we start with all of the MC3 rocks, um, MC3 is what they call a microconglomerate. It's kind of got pea-sized pebbles in it. So they're teeny weeny little pebbles um, all packed together. Um, if you look at that uh, several thousand samples in the drill holes, the average grade of the microconglomerate is very low. It's waste material on average. Uh, below 0.2 grams per ton. When you find the single yes no question that best separates good from bad, high grade from low grade, it turns out to be the thickness of that unit. If, if the thickness is over two meters, the average grade is now really low, it's 0.05. And if the thickness is less than two meters, the average grade is pretty high. So, so you get almost a 10 to one separation here off of that single question. And then if you apply that recursive trick again, and you take this group of data, and you ask, well, for that group, what's the next best yes, no question for separating high grade from low grade? It turns out that the next most important thing you need to think about is what's the overlying unit. If the overlying unit is a, a, a matrix-supported conglomerate, um, then the grade is up to 0.73. If it's not a matrix-supported conglomerate, down to 0.28. And so now you've you separated the, the MC3 intervals into three groups, a really low grade group, a pretty low grade group, and something that on average would count as ore. And, and I think what's going on there, when you think your way through the questions, is that that's exactly what happens in a placer environment. This, this pea-sized MC3 conglomerate, if that's what's lying on the floor of the creek, as the water washes over it, and as the tide moves the water back and forth, you've got the perfect natural sluice box. It, it, it's the ideal thing to trap gold grains in the bottom sediment. And, and so you've got the, the correct bottom conditions, and that's what that is saying there. You, you, you need, what, what the first question is telling you is that the, the gold is loading from the top. If you've got 20 meters of MC3 and you're loading gold from the top, it's really only the top meter or two that's picking up gold. And, and the stuff that's 10, 12, 16 meters down, it's not getting anything. So, so you're getting kind of a fixed mass of gold going into a column that's of different thicknesses. And if that thickness is low, the grade will be higher. Um, and then the second question here is telling you that not only do you need the perfect natural sluice box on the bottom, you also need the right water velocity riding above that. If the, you need gold to be in the water to settle out and get trapped in the bottom sediments. <laughs> and so if the water is moving too fast, the gold will move right on past. If it's moving too slow, the gold will never get there. And it's right in that kind of Goldilocks sweet spot in the middle where it's neither too fast nor too slow. And you're able to bring gold to that point, but it's barely in suspension. It's kind of part of that rolling bottom load. And it gets trapped in this, these little pea-sized gravels. And so when I saw that, and it falls out really cleanly, really nicely with thousands of data available, 
I thought that that's a gravel bed that's getting loaded from the top with gold grains flowing in the water. That's what that is. And it has nothing to do with epigenetics and hydrothermal fluids. Um, one of the questions we kicked out, stubbed our toes on pretty quickly was if it's a coastal paleoplacer, why is it so far from the coast? Um, turns out that there's pretty good work in the past uh, five years on ancient paleoplate reconstructions. Uh, this is work done by Bruce Eglinton at the University of Saskatchewan. Um, about two billion years ago, there was a supercontinent that formed near the southern pole. Um, two of those plates, the green plates, are now parts of modern day South America. Two of them are parts of Africa. It, it turned out that Castello de Sogno sat near the shore, just along the shore from where Tarqua sat at the time. And, and so the same gold deposits, all these little green, uh, sorry, all these little orange triangles here, that were feeding the creeks and rivers that um, eventually created the Tarqua deposits, um, it's that same kind of Andes like ridge that's creating the the load for Castello de Sanos. That, that's our belief based on Bruce Eglinton's work. So here's what we do with the quantitative risk assessment. We have to build our 100 different models. Uh, we have to understand something about the architecture of this uh, fluvio-deltaic system. Um, once we've got the 100 models, we will rank them from smallest to largest using metal content inside a pit shell. And we'll use the 10th and 90th percentiles as our low side case and high side case. Uh, um, I'll show you just one, one little bit of the detail just because it's fun to look at. But one of the things we, we kind of know about this environment is that the direction of maximum continuity is not a straight line. But whenever you look at fluvial systems, whether it's at the 10 kilometer scale, this is uh, from a space shuttle photo, or at the kind of 100 meter scale, <laughs> this is from Iceland, or at the one meter scale, this is beach sand in uh, Ventry in Ireland, you get that characteristic sinuosity <laughs> with things kind of wandering back and forth. And, and so when we're, we're modeling our goal distributions, <laughs> we want them to kind of have that characteristic geometry. And, and there's a tool that was developed for the uh, oil and gas industry um, for simulating those kind of geometries. And I'll just show you how it works here. Um, the blacks here are, uh, wells that have uh, oil and gas wells that have sand at this particular level. The whites have shale. Uh, and so there's some kind of uh, fluvio deltaic system kind of coming down through all the black bits here. And what we're going to try and do with the computer is simulate the backbones of the, the channels. And so there's this um, little thing that keeps um, small children and cats entertained um, where you, you can create these backbones that, that, that have. Um, parameters that the geologists can, can control. You, you can control the, the, the kind of um, periodicity, like the wavelength, how far apart are the bends. You can control the, the size of the bends. You can control the, the broad direction. So there's kind of a, a northwest to southeast directionality to it. So, so we used that for Castello de Sonos. We created um, models first of lithology of our different conglomerate lithologies all the way out to sandstone. So the, the yellows here are closer to the shoreline, and they're grading into the, the finer grain sediments, the browner things here. And, and you can see that what these are following, all the wiggles you're getting here are these blue lines that are coming from that simulation tool that I showed you on the previous slide. Once we've got lithology, we can overlay gold grade on top of that. Um, so this is a map of gold grade. Um, there's kind of a sweet spot that forms in here where the grade tends to be higher. But even in that sweet spot, y you can get absolutely barren material, which is what we know from the way that heavy minerals separate, settle out in, in that uh, river environment. But we also had to deal with alteration. I haven't talked about that. But we know that um, the hematite and silicic alteration tends to increase the gold grade in certain rock types. So at the end of the day, we have 100 of these models. We, there's the whole histogram of them. The 10th percentile turns out to be about 2.1 million ounces. The 90th percentile turns out to be about 4.3. So that was the exploration target range that we published in March of this year. Um, when you get to that point, a lot of people think, boy, this is just like computer modeling gone mad. <laughs> like you've just got 100 models, and you're just making stuff up. And it's true, there's a lot of assumptions that are being built in, into this. 
But the thing that I think is really good about this technique is that all the assumptions are testable through field work. And, and they're all plausible. Like we, we do know something about how fluvio-deltaic environments form. And, and so we can kind of keep ourselves um, on the, the straight and narrow by making sure that our geological reasoning is, is brought to bear on all of our parameter choices. And, and so we have assumed that gold grade follows lithology and that the lithology proportions are influenced by distance from shore. We have assumed that the gold grades tend to be higher in the coarser rocks um, and that we'll get kind of lenses of mineralization that, that uh, thin and break up as we go away from the old shoreline. Um, we, there's a bit of structure involved in this whole thing. That horseshoe shape that you get is the result of a fold that's tilted. And, and so we have to be able to unfold that and, and undo the little bit of faulting. So, so all of those are assumptions that we built in. But where we're at right now, as of, well, today, um, is we've uh, been able to raise the money to do the exploration work that proves up the concept. So the previous drill holes from 2014 are these light blue ones. What we started doing in September is these big step out holes, 400 meters at a time, um, to prove up the big picture. We're saying in that March 43 101 report, we're saying this whole conglomerate band is mineralized. And, and so to march 400 meters past the last hole, drill and find the gold again, do 400 meters, drill and find it again, it, it, it speaks to that part of the concept. And, and we drilled six holes or more than two kilometers past the last resource, and we found gold in every hole in economic thicknesses and at economic grades. Um, we then have to infill this with um, probably with RC drilling um, so that we can do a resource calculation because our exploration target is not a resource calculation. Um, and, in, and to do that resource calculation, we're going to bring in some other tools from the oil and gas industry. We're going to be doing petrophysics and televiewer on the uh, diamond drill holes and the RC holes so that we can model the stratigraphic architecture of this um, set of um, lobes of sediment that formed near the, the mouth of a, a delta or near the mouth of a river or maybe two or three rivers like in Nome, Alaska. And, and so we're, we're able to kind of move on uh, with the work. And so my conclusion here is that um, geostatistics, um, especially its conditional simulation toolkit, not, not so much the Krieging stuff, but the conditional simulation toolkit has an important role to play in helping to understand and quantify the potential of a project. Um, and, and even where regulations kind of stifle the use of that kind of Monte Carlo approach, those same regulations do permit the results of simulation to be used for reporting an exploration target range. And, and the thing that I've learned in spades over the last year, now kind of wearing the hat of a vice president in, in a junior mining company, is that projects get funded and advanced only when management has a clear vision for the future possibilities and when investors believe that it's worth funding. And so, so this was an exercise in storytelling. We had to get out there and tell a story to people that A, made technical sense and was based on a lot of science and, and statistics and that people could get excited about. Um, and and that, that allowed us this year to get the funding, to do the exploration, to take the next step. And if we hadn't been able to do that, if we hadn't made the land payments, if we hadn't done new drilling, the, the project would be stalled right now. So, so I, I think that the, the real success of conditional simulation is that it reveals the potential in a way that non-technical people can readily comprehend. And so what it really is, is it's a way of storytelling. And so that's my story, and I'm sticking to it.